CLS Talks. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Real information. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Welcome along to the CLS Talks, the second in our series on the art of war. We're back from China. Des Carty's here with me in studio. Des, how you doing? Oh, the old trip was good, wasn't it, Lionel? Uh, yeah, the flight was horrendous, but yeah. the trip was great. <laughs> what a thing to see, the Great Wall, eh? Oh, brilliant. Uh, okay, the art of war is a relatively short book, and it primarily contains three main parts in it. Uh, the first part being, it's intermingled, but the, the main, if you like, three components of it would be planning, going to war and the use of spies. Yeah. Uh, now, no, just to get right into it, so what we would intend to do over the next series of talks is we'll probably jump around a bit as well, but what we'll do is uh, in this session, perhaps we'll summarise it, summarise the chapters, extrapolate maybe a few key phrases from the art of war and then get into more detail as, as the time goes on and we go back and forth, back and forth. So mm-hmm. we'll be reiterating a lot of stuff and repeating a lot of stuff, I'd imagine. But as we talked about earlier, a lot of people probably need that. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, a reminder for those who want a copy of The Art of War, you will find it on the CLS website as well. Yeah. So you can download a PDF there for free. Um, we've also relaunched or relaunching the website. So it's the CLS.1. The CLS.1, it's very simple. Okay, we'll get the link up as well on the YouTube box and the podcast box. So however however you're listening, you'll find a link there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's delve into the meat and potatoes of the matter. Okay, so to lead with, um, I'll take the lead for the moment, Lionel. Okay. You jump any time you feel comfortable. (laughs) Be careful what you wish We'll end up (laughs) having a sword fight here in a minute. (laughs) Okay, so to lead with... um, one of the we can jump around on this obviously and you, we can go off into different tangents but the, the leading thing I'd say is planning mm. which would be about exploring the elements um, defined in competitive as they call it competitive position so you're talking about the mission of what you're attempting to try and do the climate around you and Sun Tzu often refer to the physical climate around them but we can devolve that into something else ourselves as we go on the ground if you like the the battleground per se and in this case it primarily c- it could be the side of the road for example mm. it yep. could be the courtroom uh, the command who's commanding if, if you're in a position as being the sovereign being the general being the spy being the soldier being the warrior whatever it might be so who at, the, at that time is in command and the Mets is then used so basically it, it basically that covers planning per se on a broad scale but obviously there's an awful lot more to that and just to interject I think the most important thing when planning is don't just know the objective for your battle know what your ultimate goal is you should always have as the biggest frame of all knowing exactly what you want so it it doesn't matter let's make up something for argument's sake um, you've been pulled over on the side of the road and you feel wronged by what you've been accused of know that you ultimately don't want to pay a fine for that and you don't want to end up in jail for argument's sake that's your ultimate goal and everything else falls underneath that or within that frame Mm. I think a theme a recurring theme that's going to run through everything we're going to do from here on in anyway and it probably is really concerned with the fact that we're in legal land per mm. se and we'll be, that's our battleground if you like is this and it, Sun Tzu mentions it himself in the book anyway it's the art and the the art of deception so that is going to be a continuous recurring theme and what I'd say to the listeners at this point in time is keep that in mind deception is almost everything when it comes to war when it comes to battle and when it comes to these types of things so deception 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 is key and we'll get into more detail, obviously, as we go on, but recognising their deception mm. and then recognising what it is you can do to counter their deceptions, be it being deceptive yourself to a certain extent. Yeah. And that doesn't always have to be a negative thing. It can be 
it can can be a negative thing but like any tool it can be used for good or for bad yep. and as a defensive weapon it's very very powerful indeed again recommended reading for anybody who might like to look at the psychology of that and the PDF is on the website is Propaganda by Edward Bernays just to get again a frame on what propaganda is what deception is and how you can sell a story a product or whatever it is by accessing somebody's subconscious yeah Bernays was the nephew of the psychologist, what's his name, Freud? Yeah, Freud. And he basically told, he took Freud's ideas and sold them to the American public, basically. Exactly, and that's why smoking became such a popular thing. So healthy. He was used to sell World War II to the masses as well, which is another interesting footnote in history. That's where marketing comes from, it's propaganda, isn't it? That's what marketing is, it's propaganda. Yeah, and almost all of it is based on... Bernaysian theory. Hmm. Now, the next, if you like, key area we'll be covering is actually going to war. And it's something that at the CLS, we've been doing this with people for a long time, is explaining to them that their opponent per se, be it a bank, be it a legal team, whatever it might be, Hmm. there's an economic cost to going to war. And you have to sort of manage that. So in the context of you being a lay litigant and an independent party going to war against a bank or a solicitor or whatever it might be your economic frame is going to be an awful lot smaller you won't have as big a budget obviously and you won't have as big a cost or an expenditure for that matter so there is a cost benefit analysis that every bank have to do or every attacker has to do when they're bringing you into court and when they're attacking you from that perspective so they have to measure up how in the long term or medium term or short term it's going to be to their benefit Mm. because if it drags on too long it's a drain on their finance so as we say it's a cost benefit analysis how long can we maintain this attack how long can we afford to maintain the attack so that's what going to war is primarily concerned about Mm. which we'll also delve into as well as we go along is there anything else you want to say on that well I think a good example of that is possibly the Uh, the US in Vietnam Mm -hmm. I mean the military might of the US the reason they couldn't defeat the North Vietnamese was quite simply because it was too expensive the war was clearly dragging on and on and would have continued to drag on and why was that? Well because the North Vietnamese they knew their enemy they knew the battleground they had planned Mm -hmm. they were decisive in, in they knew when to retreat they knew when to attack and they were in for the long haul. So yeah. while they didn't necessarily have the might of the US military, they did have all the other things that are necessary to win a war on their side. So they lost lots of battles, mm. but ultimately mm. won the war because it became too draining, both to the morale and psychology of the US as a nation, and also then to the military in financial terms. So yeah. they just couldn't win that war. Yeah, impossible. It's the same with any perceived, um, if you like, invading nation. I mean, it would be the same nowadays in some of the Arabian countries and as Mm. in Iran, Iraq, uh, Libya, blah, blah, blah. There's loads and loads of countries out there that if the people themselves decide, no, we don't want this, Mm. it's going to be ultimately impossible for the British troops or the American troops or any colonial troop that's coming in to defeat the people. And again, that's where our planning comes in and our spies as well, because you've got to win the hearts and minds of the enemy somehow. Exactly. Now, the the, f- the final core part of the art of war would centre around using and the use of spies. Mm. So, again, we're devolving ourselves at the moment. If you're starting off as a one-man band or a one-woman band, you are the spy to start with. But we get on into how best then to use that ability, plus how to bring in people for yourself to be able to make use of them as spies. And we have lots and lots of examples of that as we get into this. Now, spies means a lot of things. It also means research, knowledge, finding out, so on and so forth. So, so it's your information gathering. It's your information gathering. Yeah. Your, your, mode or your modus of correct, uh, collecting information about the enemy. Now, the other thing as well, I just want to say this quickly on spies. Um, basically, to find out the information that you need in relation to perceivably fighting a legal firm, uh, the state, a set of judges, a banks, whatever, all that information is freely available to you. Mm. It's not difficult to get it. Now, getting the right information is the hard part, uh, if you like, devolving down into finding the right and most appropriate information. But that isn't too difficult either. Once you get into doing some critical research, you'll find the information that you need relatively quickly, I would imagine. Yeah, I think so. And you become much, much better at disseminating information and realising what's bluster and what's not. And it does get Mm. easier as it goes on. It's never easy, but it gets easier. Yeah. Okay. um, Then, if you like, 
to, to give people a sort of lead in again to what we're doing, we will summarize the book. I have a summary of the book here. If do you want to have a look at it or read it out? And yeah. 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 I think it's a good it's thing only a few to do. sentences anyway, Lionel. The book in three sentences. Know when to fight and when not to fight. Avoid what is strong and strike at what is weak. Know how to deceive the enemy. Appear weak when you are strong and strong when you are weak. Know your strengths and weaknesses. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. So that's a really good summary of where we're going. So to elaborate with some quotes here, and there's some very interesting quotes as well. According as circumstances are favourable, one should modify one's plans. Yeah, now that's a brilliant opening line really because it's it's very easy uh, for you as an individual, as an individual lay litigant or persona going into the court to modify your plans because you haven't got this whole structure mm. of what the state have or what a, a set of solicitors have or what a bank have. They have to go through a set of processes, a set of protocols to make sure everybody has signed off on the right thing. So you can modify your plans very quickly and very effectively. Yeah, and if your preparation mm. is done and you see a chink in the arm or say, for example, you're cross-examining, you can go and attack that yep. and by all means modify your plans. You, c- you could get out of court that day with a victory rather than waiting another year, you know? Mm-hmm. So the next one, all war- warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we're far away. And when we're far away, we must make the enemy believe we are near. Mm -hmm. So it's guerrilla warfare, it's deception, it's smoke and mirrors. And this is something that the state or whoever your your opposition is can't always do because, as you mentioned, they have a certain procedure, they have protocols that they are certainly meant to adhere to. And they do have their own systematic way of doing things. And quite often when you have a lot of people involved or you have a machinery involved, it can be very, very difficult for them then to modify their behaviour. I might suggest this juncture um, that people go and look up the word deception Mm. and the connotations there is with the word deception and the other meanings of the word deception. Um, Something we spoke about earlier, Lionel, in terms of the state Mm. and their deceptions, because whether or not people know this, realise this, understand this, the state have a long-term plan in terms of deception. And if you look at this from a psychological perspective, we've discussed this topic before, whereby... The schools and perhaps your parents as well have conditioned or programmed you in terms of not being deceptive when dealing with other people. I would imagine that a lot of the people, say like the politicians, some of the solicitors, barristers, the judges, that was never programmed out of them mm. to, be, to be not dece- or to be deceptive. So I'd imagine that's still that's still part of their makeup that they can put on a face or a persona and act that part out and be deceptive continuously and consistently and that's what helps their game so the state and the church if we look at recent events in terms of what's been discovered with the mother and child homes and all the rest of it the state have a program in place to coerce and deceive people over a long period of time so then for most people that go to court the deal's already done the game's already over because they've already psychologically accepted that they're probably wrong. Mm. They've probably already lost this war. They're just going through the motions. But what you get from a very, very young age is from your parents, from some parents, from school, from primary school, secondary school, up to university. And then if you're a church goer, you get it from the church. You are told this moral, you're given this moral imperative that you shouldn't be deceptive. Mm. You shouldn't mislead people. You shouldn't do all the things that the solicitors do. Yeah that the banks do, that the politicians do. So most people, the unwashed masses per se, are brought up on this diatribe of not doing or not being deceptive. So that's already conditioned into most people from a very, very young age, whether or not you realise it. And then when it comes to, for most people, going to court, psychologically they're already beaten Yeah. in terms of the language and what's in their head because they would say, well, I wouldn't be in court if I was right. I must be wrong. Mm. So this is something that we have. If you recognize this, that that's what's already been programmed into you, it's far easier then to counter that and to recognize that and then to come back at it and say, well, okay, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Let's fight fire with fire. The state over a long period of time use coercion and deception 
Mm-hmm. So if I, I, I can't stress this enough. People have to start recognizing that because then it makes what you're doing in terms of protecting yourself and perceivably then going on the attack against be the bank, the state, the, the courts, the judges, whatever, it makes it psychologically easier mm-hmm. to be able to deal with those uh, that thing as a weapon. So you can use deception as inferred by the art of war as a weapon. But I'd suggest again, I, I can't iterate this hard enough or succinctly enough, people need to look up the term deception and what it actually means. Yeah, because the trick is not to allow the state to have a monopoly on deception or anything else. Because if the state has a monopoly on force, for example, you can't defend yourself. If the state has a monopoly on deception, again, you can't Mm -hmm. defend yourself, albeit in a different way. So recognize a monopoly when you see it Mm -hmm. and fight back, to use heavy quotation marks there. Fight fire with fire, essentially, because that's exactly what they don't want you to do. Why don't they want it? Because they fear it. Yeah. And once you see, it's like seeing the woods from the trees. Once you see the deception, it's so much easier then to psychologically deal with it and counter it. Yeah, you have a whole new frame of reference. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think, is most people's block, is they don't see the deception Mm. and what has been done to them from very early on, as you rem- we made a reference to this before about cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Everybody knows in their gut there's something wrong, but it's very difficult to pinpoint it. Mm-hmm. You're continuously um, deceiving yourself, per se. Yeah, you're lying to yourself yep. or deceiving yourself or whatever it might be, just to justify the conditioning that you have that you may not even realise is embedded yeah. in the subconscious. But no, I, I'd hope that people will wake up to this and realise, yeah, we have been conditioned. Mm. Like, uh, we're not uh, exempt from this either. We've all, we've all yeah. been conditioned all to been varying conditioned. degrees, yeah. Um, and I, I would say, look at recent the recent uh, stuff in the press about the church because the church and the state work hand in glove Mm. they always have done they coexist together and the basis for what they've done is down to one thing only money Mm. profit because that would not have happened if there was no profit in it Mm -hmm. somebody profited somewhere and that's what I'd say to people also now I know it's kind of off on a tangent but I think it's very pertinent to recent deceptions is that there's, there's, the media are prolific now about talking about this subject matter. And, but nobody's saying what I would see, or perhaps what you would see, is follow the money. Mm. Who profited from the selling of babies, the experimentation of babies being sold to universities? It's basically slavery, isn't it? It's yeah. basically they sold people on, they used those women and children and, and, and boys and girls and all the rest of it, and they made profit from the work they did. And they made the greater mass of people complicit in it again through conditioning because, yeah. okay, let's target those who we have told you are sinners, for example. Yeah. So we can then do what we want. Everybody else will turn a blind eye or won't look in any direction that we tell them not to look in. Therefore, we can do what we want with impunity and deceive the people. Yeah. So I would say follow the money. For those that are listening and have an issue with this, follow the money. There was an example on some program I watched there a few months ago and I wondered like were the mother and child homes were they actually getting money for the children that they sold and it's, it wasn't obvious they were getting money but then they let something slip the the child that went back and traced his the parents to this it was actually mother and child home in Carlo I think it was and what was released now it was it was just like a passing comment a passing remark was that they had a receipt for the money they paid for clothes for the child okay okay now the money of the day was absolutely for those clothes was extortionate okay like you could have gone down to the shop and bought those clothes for 10 cent or 10 pence at that time whereas these guys were charged pounds at the time so I can see now how they covered themselves in terms of the exchange of funds or money plus an awful lot of those people that took those children also contributed donations in the aftermath of taking the children as well so there was a continuous flow of money coming into the church Mm -hmm. coffers so they got the people at the beginning paid for the clothes Mm -hmm. not for the child but a huge amount of money for this set of clothes that the child came in. Mm-hmm. And then after that, there was donations made by the parents for the child that they had just bought. Okay. 
So there's money. It's, it's follow the money. That's what I say. And people haven't caught on to this for some reason. And I see it everywhere because the only reason the state and the church did these things was for money. Mm-hmm. Money, money, money. That's it. Profit. And again, look at the flip side of that then and examine our conditioning with regard to it. If you happen to think that garlic or apples or apples are garlic and you mistakenly label as such, well, mm-hmm. where can you end up? You can end up in a, in a cage. Correct. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So why aren't these people in cages? Mm-hmm. That's what I want. You know. Well, I think it's because we have allowed them a monopoly on deception yeah. and on the perceived th- the perceived truth, which is mm. generally deception it when it deception. comes to conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. They have a monopoly on deception. That's a very good phrase. Sun Tzu should have taken a, a couple of lessons from you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write my own yeah. book. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're going to leave it there for this episode. We are, of course, back next week. Thanks for joining me, Des. Thanks very much, Lionel. Thanks for listening, folks. CLS Talks.